about community somehow, and, and maybe one way to talk about this is that there's going to be some local choices, nearby choices, and they're going to have global consequences. It sounds I've been pretty, pretty terrifying. Um, there's a lot of these so-called local, global things in mathematics, you know. So I could have told you know, you think that's community. I mean, and everything. But it, anyway, so there's local things and global things, and that's part of the story. So we'll start, I guess, with three vignettes with with lights out, which uh, which is a game, and uh, the, the game of, of lights out is uh, played on a, on a grid of lights. So this is one of the lattice things again, and the lights are also push buttons, and when you push the button the state of some of the lights uh, flips. <laughs> so it's, it's an honest game. I mean, like, here it is. <laughs> Look at this. You can purchase this game for the unbelievable price of $69. Oh, <laughs> Only one cut. <laughs> <laughs> Go now, anyway, but that's just unbelievably expensive. The game's been around, you know, they've made this little, little chintzy plastic game for a long time. But anyhow, uh, so the actual game, you can play it. And, uh, and here, here, instead of purchasing the version of it, you can, you can play it on the internet. Here it is. So this is, this is lights out. It's a five by five grid, and they're, they're yellow with the lights on. And when I click on one of the buttons, the stage of the button and the neighboring button splits. So if I click here, state flips again. Yeah, okay, so that's that's the game, and the game is to you know sort of try to push the buttons in some sort of pattern so that you know you eventually turn off all the lights. Yeah, okay. So here's here's one observation about this is you'll know, notice that when I did this I just worked across. And uh, in fact, the actual order of the button pushes doesn't matter at all. So here's you know, this is as much as anything's an insight into the game, right? I mean I push this button and then I push that button and now that's what happens, right? These buttons, these lights flip state. Right? But if I push them in the other order, same thing. Right. The, the order in which you're pushing the buttons doesn't doesn't matter at all. So that's that's one big, big observation. The other observation is watch watch what happens if you push the same button twice. No. <laughs> no. It's really unbelievable. So the the point here is that because the order of the button pushes doesn't matter, and because if you push the same button twice, nothing happens. The the first rule of lights out is just never push the same button twice. <laughs> that, so, okay. so, so now the goal is to try to figure out how to solve the, the game, right? And here, here's the 5x5 five five board, and what I, I mean, it's on a black background, I guess just dramatic reasons, but you can sort of see that there's five squares here, and some of them have uh, white squares in them. So you see, it's a 5x5 five five grid, and there's uh, some of the things in that 5x5 five five grid are, are white squares, and then some of them are black, which unfortunately is also on a black background, so you can't tell it. But you know, these are also squares. Anyhow, the, the point is that you're supposed to just push the white boxes. That's what I did a minute ago to solve it. All right. So, uh, you know, they make a 5x5 five five version of this, and the success of Lights Out as a commercial truck one year ago or whatever led to other people developing 5x6, five 6x6, six, six six, you know, Lights Out on a cube. There's a ton of different versions of this that you can purchase. I'm sure for even more money. But anyway, uh, you can also just you know, try to look at what the solutions look like for, for other boards. So here's the 6x6 the six six board. You would push these white buttons to, uh, to solve, the, uh, solve the game. It's a 7x7 seven seven solution. It's an 8x8 eight eight solution. Of course, it's some, some, I mean, symmetric, right? Uh, this one's not symmetric, so of course I can rotate this and flip it. You would still solve the game, but you know, that looks sort of like a monster. Look at that. You know, and it's a, just fantastic. I mean, just sort of stare. Look at that. I mean, they just keep getting better, don't they? Uh, got these little crazy lines here. I mean, it's really, it's really nuts. And I mean, part of the thing that I think is, is you know, sort of surprising, right? Is these these look awfully. Oh, that one doesn't look very complicated. But you know, <laughs> but they look they look really pretty pretty complicated, you know. And considering that the game you know wasn't supposed to be that hard, I mean, I think it's 
really amazing just looking at these. Now these are not unique. No, what, th this sort of stuff down here is is uh, evidence of some terrible non-uniqueness. I mean, there's sort of questions, for example, on a 61 by 61 board, how many solutions are there? There you go. You know, there are people who write papers on this. <laughs> and was this an attempt at the minimal number of uh, button presses are not really? No, this is not minimal. This is first. Is this the most artistic button presses? No, <laughs> for sure not. Because it doesn't look very symmetric. It would be better if it was symmetric. Anyway, I, I don't know. Um, talk a little bit about how these things can solve. But uh, I just, it's going to be 15 minutes of this. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, how much time did this take away from your actual tenure track process? <laughs> This, this is a good question. <laughs> this I did not do recently, thankfully. But, uh, yeah, so. Is those all by hand? By hand. Oh, yeah, so um, by hand. I don't, I don't I can't do anything by hand. I guess I made this presentation by hand in the sense that I, I don't know. That's crazy, isn't it? You went to Harvard. <laughs> by, 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 by hand. So, so this is. This, I think, is, is pretty funny. So let's suppose I wanted to solve the, the 10 by 10 problem. And uh, you know, from what we saw before, the order of the button pushes doesn't matter. If you push the same button twice, it doesn't matter. So it only matters which buttons you push. Each button, you can look at and you can decide, will I push it, will I not? So on the 10 by 10 grid, there's, there's, 100, there's 100 buttons to consider. And that means there's two to the 100th different button push you know, possibilities. And I guess if you're feeling you know, optimistic, you'll divide by eight or something to cover the symmetry. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? I mean, look at how big that number is, you know? And then you think, well, what I'll do is I'll spend a nanosecond looking at each of those 10 by, you know, each of the possible uh, button push patterns on the 10 by 10 grid and see if any of them solve the thing, and then you find out that, you know, that'll take four trillion years. <laughs> and, and this is legitimately, I mean, a, a, a friend of mine who's very good not just as a human, mathematically and everything, you know, really implemented uh, a version of this on the 5x5 five five grid, you know, and hand-optimized and assembled, and it really found solutions this way. You know, so this, this works, just not on the 10x10 10 10 grid. And uh, the point is that, well, you're supposed to actually do some, some linear algebra to make this thing go a little bit, right? Except you're supposed to do linear algebra where 1 plus 1 is 0. So, and I can put up a matrix, which might mean something or might not, but, you know, what this is, is a 9x9 nine nine matrix. And uh, this matrix is encoding what happens when you push various buttons. So you'll see, for instance, uh, in this, uh, you know, this V here is supposed to be the, the matrix that, that will tell you uh, which of the nine buttons on the three by three grid you're going to push. And then, for example, this, uh, this row, or if you like this column, it doesn't matter, you know, is telling you which, which lights will have their state switched when you push the first corner button. And you can see it's the first button, the second button, not the third button, but the fourth button, which is just under the first button. You know, and if you push the corner button, it swaps those, those four. Right? And then you can go on the next row here. And this is, if you push the second button, or the second column, it doesn't matter. But if you just look across the second row. So if you push this button here, right, it'll swap the first three on the top row and the one right below it. So maybe I just draw a picture here so this doesn't seem quite so ridiculous. Right, so here's the sort of tic-tac-toe version of this. Right, and the point is that if I push button two, right, this button, this button, this button, and this button switch state. And that's exactly what, what this matrix is encoding. Right? These three switch state, the fourth one doesn't, the fifth one does. And this is cool because it, it actually encodes the state switching since I'm pretending that one plus one is zero. So for example, if I push the first button and the second button, I either want to add these vectors to see the effect. But since 1 plus 1 is 0, when I add, say, 1 plus 1, that gives me 0. So it's as if I didn't push that, you know, that first that corner doesn't change state at all. And what you're really trying to do, right, is figure out which button pushes give you the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Right? But this is the sort of thing that computers are really good at. Really good at. So they, they can do this very, very fast. So it's really not that hard. The only bad thing is this is gigantic because you know it's polynomial, but doing the solving the linear system, uh, you know, requires uh, this big O n cubed n is the size of the matrix, and the matrix 
you know, is an n by n matrix where n is the square of the size of the board. So the 10 by 10 board's got a 100 by 100 matrix that you've got to do this sort of row reduction on. And that's sort of unfortunate because if you're doing, say, the 5,000 by 5,000 game and you want to be able to solve that, you know, even, even though you're not doing it by checking all the possibilities, which would just be an unbelievably big number, even if you use this faster method, I mean, you're, you're still n cubed is, is too big. Right, so this is not a very good method. And yet, here's a solution of a 5,000 by 5,000 board. Here it is zoomed in, and here it is zoomed in even further, right? And then you've got to wonder, well, if I, if I didn't solve that with the matrix method, what did I do to get that 5,000 by 5,000 board? It's really simple. Yeah. <laughs> really and just look at how much detail that has, you know? So the solution's tile? No. Uh, the, the boundary is actually the really exciting part of it. <laughs> the boundary really matters. So. They don't tile, but you can start tiling them and then solve the boundary independently? Maybe there's some way you can get it that way. I don't know. That's it, it can do no, I'm trying to guess what you did. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> right. Well, maybe I'll talk about that later. But the, but the port sort of moral here is that that easy little local story, right? Just the fact that you know, pushing the button changes the nearby ones. If you actually try to figure out what happens on the big picture, right? You know, good luck. <laughs> it, really, it looks really awful. <laughs> All right. So that's the first little vignette about community or about how complicated the world is, even though my personal interactions aren't that complicated. Uh, the second one, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, <laughs> the prisoner's dilemma. It is an actually a game theory thing, and Prisoner's Dilemma is a story where you're offered a choice, right? So it's a dilemma in a couple senses, but one sense in which it's a dilemma is that uh, you either get to uh, cooperate or defect. Uh, you, know, you, you imagine that you and your partner in crime get arrested, you can either you know, cooperate with your partner in crime and both remain silent and you know, get some sort of you know, misdemeanor charge, or you can you know, turn in your partner and hopefully your partner won't turn you in, and then you, know, you really can get off scot-free, deal with the authorities, and then your partner goes to jail for a long time. So that's, that's sort of the, the story about the prisoner's dilemma. And you can encode this as another matrix. The matrices are the theme here. Uh, so this, this is supposed to tell you how much money or whatever good thing, utility you get if you make a certain choice and your partner in crime makes a certain choice. Right? So if you and your partner in crime both work together and don't rat on each other, you'll get 45 points of goodness. If you turn your partner in, Right? That's even better for you. You're going to get 50 points of goodness. But from your partner's perspective, right, if you work with somebody who's ratting you out, right, that's really bad for you. And of course, what the authorities want you to do is to both rat each other out, so then you'll get you know, 15 units of, of goodness, which is a lot worse than you get if you just both work together. All right. Well, this so, is symmetric. Is it is it or are you, are you acting This is the payoff you get. A payoff you get. Yeah. That's a good question. So what's the dilemma? There's really a dilemma in two different senses, right? There's a dilemma in what you should do. But the real dilemma is, given that this is maybe how some parts of the world work, why would you ever choose to cooperate with anyone? Because no matter what the other person does, right, you're better off choosing D. So that seems like, you know, really pessimistic in my community. You know, it seems like the rational thing to do is just to always wrap each everybody out, don't work with everybody, right? So now the game is, is again going to be played on a giant square grid, and here I'm not going to go to the boundaries of the top of the grid connects to the bottom of the grid, and the right hand side connects to the left hand side. And we're going to play this prisoner's dilemma game with your neighbors, just like you possibly are doing in real life. And, um, and then after you play the game with all your neighbors, you're going to look around your neighborhood and see, is somebody doing better than I'm doing? Well, I should be more like them. So here's what happens. Here is a random assortment, you know, civilization is just assigned you randomly your, your two choices of cooperator or defect. And uh, you can see that over time, right, more defection is happening. Why, you know, keeps on going. And then eventually sort of more cooperation ends up taking over here. And I mean, what, why is this happening? Well, initially, you know, the cooperators and defectors are sort of mixed together randomly, and that's not real good because the defectors can, you know, defect against a few of the cooperators in the neighborhood. So the few cooperators that are sort of interspersed with them end up adopting that defection strategy. But then there are some clumps of cooperating people, and those people end up cooperating with each other and doing really well. And then the defecting neighbors, wow, that 
Trump are cooperating. People are doing really well cooperating with each other, so I'm going to be more like them. And then we see that cooperation ends up becoming the dominant, or at least a stable strategy. You know, I think it's fixed at this point. All right, you still get kind of these rivers of defection through this model, you know, which I guess you can sort of the dangerous neighborhoods. Is this true for any configuration, initial configuration? Uh, no, no. I mean, it, it really depends on the on the initial configuration. I mean, it depends on a bunch of parameters that I'm setting so I can tell a story. <laughs> yeah. But one of those parameters is the size of the neighborhood. Right? And if you make the neighborhoods bigger, that's not very good. Right? And the point here is that if you increase the interaction radius, which I guess is some sort of warning about globalization, uh, defection is, is more likely to end up in the neighborhood. Right? Uh, and sorry, one way to fix this is, is what? Sorry. Yeah. What, what do you mean there? Sorry? So everybody. The number of neighbors that influences you? Oh, the number of people you're playing prison dilemma with. Oh, okay. So now you're too deep? And now you're going over oh, two people okay. instead of just your direct neighbors now. I should have had a picture okay, of that. Okay, sorry. Just making slides an hour ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> really. It's amazing. Um, okay, so one thing that I want to explain is that there's, there's some issue. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the interaction radius is both the people that you're playing with as well as people yes. that you're copying. Exactly, but you could change those independently as if you want to. Uh, <coughs> so what, what is the payoff in this generalized setting? Uh, is it players only or is it a neighbor? To so you, add, you play against all your neighbors and then you get as many points from all those games. So Fair if I play game. five games, I add up all of the points okay. that I get and then I look at my total points. So one thing is that initial configuration really doesn't matter, right? So here I've increased the number of cooperators, and then even with a larger interaction radius, it, it really does end up becoming cooperation as a thing. So it really does depend on the fraction of the initial configuration, right? And uh, just keep going through, right? So the world is that which is the case, which is some sort of warning about contingency on initial conditions. Here is a picture. Uh, so what this picture shows you is the initial uh, defection population and the eventual defection population after we run this model for 30 time steps or something. And this is for the neighborhood side of one. And you can see that you know, something really bad happens. There's a lot of defectors and then defection ends up winning. But if there's not too many defectors, you still get a lot of stuff up here where uh, cooperation ends up surviving for quite some time. But if you increase the neighborhood size, you know, now it's, there are some initial configurations uh, which don't have too much initial defection that end up you know, staying in, this is exactly backwards, should be an eventual cooperation. But anyway, uh, so this you know this, this shows that there's a you know eventually there is some small amount of initial affection that ensures that you have a cooperation surviving. And then if you make the neighborhood uh, interaction radius even larger, right, then it's even harder to have cooperation survive. So that's sort of this point. Does yeah. This depend on the payoff matrix that you put? No, this is just for a particular payoff matrix. So really, there's a bunch more parameters that. So the last thing I'll show you is the video appropriation, which may or may not work. Looks like it's going to work. Or not. There we go. This is one more really short story about neighborhoods. So what's happening here is I'm just throwing down random dots. And whenever two dots touch each other, they adopt the color of the larger dot, the larger collection of dots. Wow. Gray wins. So who wins? Gray. Gray ends up winning. No, as in when two colors, so. The larger one takes it. By larger you one. define that. Yeah, yeah. The larger so group. the point here, just to say, you know, is here it is with 25,000 dots at some point. You can see there's still a lot of sort of pretty colors, right? And the, even the, the sort of zoomed in detail is really quite quite interesting, you know. But then eventually, right, it just becomes one big blob. But there's still larger in terms of the size of the circle or the number of dots. Uh, more dots. More dots. Yeah. Yeah. So more, more dots, dots or more area. So if you land a dot on top of three dots that exist, <laughs> that's three dots, not that's one, it's two dots. If I take two dots and put them next to each other, that's, that's two dots. Even if they completely overlap. Yes. But that will never happen. 
<laughs> Are we to assume that you hate Google Station? <laughs> yeah, that would be the test of my message. Yeah. <laughs> so what does the spectrum look like? What is the current thing? Like, Isn't that a great question? Yeah. yeah. No, that's that, and that's that's really right? Like, how many clusters do you get for a certain number of dots? Right? And that that is a really interesting question, right? And I think it's really neat also that when there's a lot of dots, there's still a few outliers. Even when there's just one big clump, there's still a few outliers that survive for a really long time. You know? and so, I mean, Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to, so we use Prisoner Shalama a lot in Animal Behavior. Oh, great. So, yeah. So, to talk about how you get the evolution of altruistic traits. You know, Good, yes. We, we do this a lot. But I thought that the... Upshot, it's about Molly or Jim, was that one Pavlov or whatever, where you look at what the previous, the outcome of the previous interaction uh, was? Yeah, so there's, there's an iterated prisoner's dilemma thing that people do, you know, you know, like tit for tat, you know, yeah. successful strategy, and that kind of So, no. Uh, only one, yeah. there's, there's only two strategies in this model. So I, I do have some work where yeah. there's, there's um, computer programs running each yeah. of nodes, and then the computer programs can do anything they want. Oh, no, I just thought the name of the one where you look at what yeah, what, what payoff was from the previous um, interaction, and then you shape your response based on that. Was it named Pavlov or something like that? Oh, great. That sounds like... But it sounds like what you... <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm wondering is, I thought the outcome of those was that, like, um, there were very few strategies that were... The reason that... The argument behind why evolution, why you don't normally get altruism evolving is because um, you have to come up with a cooperative strategy that can't be invaded by, a, you know, a defector yeah. um, that would immediately spread and wipe out everybody else. And so I'm just trying to think of what's different in, in your models that made it so that just having the community structure and no other factors caused it to. Yeah, I mean there is the, the fact I mean there, there is some grid thing here. Some of these models are just a pile. So I, I, I feel like kind of sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I feel like even though the setup is game theoretic, uh, the rules are deterministic. They are not strategic in this game. In the sense that a person copies something that someone else did that paid off, rather than strategically to, trying to see who the neighbors are and uh, and then trying to invade that strategy. If you think strategically, you will get a different result. But I feel like this is a copy, deterministic copycat strategy. So. If you're, if you're surrounded by cooperators, uh, you are likely to cooperate because you're copying cooperators. Is that? That sounds. That? <laughs> 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 but this, that's that's the that's people are not optimally behaving like economic agents as they should. And if they did, I mean, we use prisoners for a long time, and with a tit for tat strategy or an iterative game, you always, I mean, you can get a stable cooperative strategy in a game, right? And also that the the neighborhood, so there is a lot of economic literature on neighborhood sorting, and in fact, people do behave exactly this way into why they sort into neighborhoods, and real estate pricing can, I mean, just analyzing real estate markets can tell you why people with different preferences, preference structures, behaving optimally would get into the same game of markets, which is pretty cool that's to say that too. you can do that too. <laughs> So I didn't understand Susan's comment. So, so what was, I mean, what was the strategy that you were describing? Well, just it's hard to come up with a strategy that models how you could have cooperative behavior spreading that couldn't secondarily become if you had a single individual who was um, who was a defector just coming in and wiping out everybody else, and spreading and spreading and spreading because the cooperating individuals of the strategy is to, to continue to cooperate. Like just hit them, hit them, hit them, hit them. Well, he, it's, it's a very different model. So in the kind of model that she's taking and talking about, those points that people are getting in each round, they spend them to reproduce, right? So each C, when it's built up a number of 100, 100 points or whatever, makes another C. Mm -hmm. And then each D, when it builds up a number yeah, of points. It's genetic, or whatever, so it's D. passed on. So what you do, it's, I mean, I think you can model it different ways. You can model it within a lifespan, which what I do in this interaction should dictate what happens in my next interaction, but you could also do it for each rep representing an entire lifespan. So the outcome of my, my single interaction in my life should dictate whether whether I'm able to spread my genes or not. So isn't it, sorry, Susan, isn't there also like not just the payoff, but also the punishment? Like 
that's mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah this one there's only 15 points, yeah. so you just end up doing less, and so, but I don't know, maybe that is a punishment if you need 20 to live, I guess, and you have 15. <laughs> I have a question about the like, fourth, I guess, uh, Susan and Satya probably use this. So is it just one cost function? or uh, one score, or can there be multiple scores? So for example, uh, you can be happy and rich and uh, have a big family. Uh, you can do all of those one at a time, or you can have these three different things. Uh, which is why you have a utility function, which puts all those things into it. And, and you maximize, find all these wits for that. And then you maximize the utility. We were, we were actually talking about that in the Women's Health Edition earlier today. We wanted to decide. You were in the Women's Health Edition? Yes. That's <laughs> why it's the initiative. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. It's clarifying. Sam is pro women. Yes. <laughs> I don't know why people keep finding that surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, like, does this wait? Does yeah, it yeah. have to be the same for everyone in the community? Or can it oh, be? Oh, that's yeah. what you mean. The wait, the way, I mean, if, if we were to think of the sorting or all, all the shit for that, you do sort of assume that people have a homogenous preference structure. Or you have people with different different preferences, so their utility functions look a little different. Yeah. Uh, but they're all combinations of, you know, health and happiness and family and everything else, which we magically put a dollar value in. So but for, like for real estate that might actually have is that might actually create the neighborhoods themselves, right? That uh, people want certain kind of lifestyles to all segregate themselves into a community. Exactly. And that is why I mean why that's why neighborhoods that have you know, that have a park next to it. Those houses are more expensive because people value the park. Or why are you know houses along Lake Erie more expensive or less if it's if there's an island loan? So you can actually incorporate that into why how the housing price moves, right? So but but you do assume that people have a somewhat homogeneous preference structure or you, you, you can randomize the preference structure and see how these communities actually sort into neighborhoods. And why you have a you know high crime neighborhood in one region, property values are very low, and you have a really nice aesthetic neighborhood in another region, property values are really high. And then what is the only way we can link property values to people is that we also know by census what these people do, how much they earn, how many kids they have, so on. And so you can basically connect how the real estate market, how much they care for the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms in their house worse and what who they are to then see how people with different characteristics sort into neighborhoods with different kinds of houses or different amenities, right? It's not entirely prisoners to them, but <laughs> so, any question well I guess maybe for both of you, um, about the use of or how um, the radius of influence like impacts the modeling that you're doing? Like if you do you because you were saying, you know, one interaction then determines how you pass on your genes, do you go multi-generational impacts? I, yeah, I use this myself when I do teach it when I teach animal behavior because okay. it's kind of one of the foundations of how some of the early um, ideas in animal behavior were based. Um, but I I don't know, like the the dots can represent different things, right? Because they could represent repeated interactions with, over time as scale and space, but they can also represent physical space or they can re represent genetic relatedness. Like I know right. that although, you know, generally in evolutionary biology, we don't like tend to support the idea that there's <coughs> group, sele group selection in which groups are uh, <coughs> doing things for the good of the group, but if you actually model a situation like this in which you're talking about relatedness among individuals who are close together and less close together as you get further apart and include it in the model, then and if, if you look at the space as relatedness, then then this would go, right? You would get cooperation spreading. Um, and so I've seen other people who've taken that idea and just substituted the relatedness in for a spatial element and said if everyone is stable in location, um, can you get a similar situation in which cooperation spreads? And they've demonstrated that, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know, is that, I don't know if I did that. <laughs> Does that answer your question? 